My name is William Carney, and I'm the defense team's investigator, advisor, and narrator for this presentation. My goal throughout this display is to present and explain all the individuals, locations, and events that pertain to this case before, during, and after the incident on July 2nd, 2012. Painting a clear picture of all these dynamics is a must, and is the only way an audience can get a ringside seat and get a real feel for these unique set of circumstances. This clear view will create a mindset as to where our soldiers had to live, work, and last but not least, survive in on a daily basis. Please, let's also remember that this newly discovered evidence you're about to see was obtained in the ordinary course of business from U.S. government databases used routinely in identifying, tracking, and prosecuting the Taliban and insurgent fighters in Afghanistan. These databases will be familiar to some. One in particular is called SIDNI, the Combined Information Data Network Exchange. The methods used to assess this evidence are the same as those forwarded to the Afghan investigators, prosecutors, judges, and defense attorneys used during prosecution of the Taliban and insurgent fighters in Afghanistan before the national security courts, such as those in the Justice Center in Palwan, Bagram Airfield, Afghanistan. Kandahar province is one of the most southernmost provinces in Afghanistan, along with Helmand province, which is its neighbor to the west. As we can see, the Zari district is completely surrounded by Taliban-controlled areas, especially those bordering the province of Helmand. Lieutenant Lawrence and his 1st platoon were assigned to Strong Point Payanzai, which was located in the Saranzai village, Zari district of Kandahar province of Afghanistan. Again, we see the hostile districts of Maywan, Panjue, Daman, and Aghanam, which completely surrounds Zare in the strong point location of the 82nd Airborne. This entire region is well documented for the flow of weapons, IED materials, and facilitators that are transported to and from Helmand province on a daily basis. Another important component that must be introduced and understood by the viewer is the techniques, tactics, and procedures used by the Taliban, or also known as TTPs. There are many, but one in particular stands out throughout the Zari district and all of Afghanistan, and that is the use of motorcycles. Many Afghan citizens use the motorcycle as a simple and cheap mode of transportation. One doesn't have to be in Afghanistan long to see it's a major way of life for many. The Taliban uses this way of life to blend in when conducting their nefarious activities. Why do they use it? Very easy maneuverability in and out of villages for their attacks, easy escape routes after those attacks, and very simply, easy to hide when not in use. As we look at the images before us, we see what looks like an ordinary Afghan on a motorcycle. We may not think twice about him, especially when he's driving by you at a normal rate of speed. But what we don't see is that he's carrying weapons for either transportation purposes or to initiate an immediate attack. Difficult to spot standing still, virtually impossible to detect at a high rate of speed. The Taliban knows this and uses it for their advantage on a daily basis. In the photo just to the right of our motorcycle rider, we see another popular tactic, and that's the group ride. Depicted here is a common formation where there are numerous motorcycles with anywhere from one to three riders on each. All riders have a specific assignment. One motorcycle is usually a diversion, whether it be an explosion or traffic distraction, followed by the other riders to initiate the different phases of the complex attacks. Multiple riders on the motorcycle are useful when the passengers are able to jump off quickly, possibly for another diversion, or to walk or crawl to a location to communicate to the other riders who are following or who may be leading in the first phase of the attack. In our photo to the lower left, is very, very important and one we overlook many times, and that is how we underestimate what a rider can carry when on a mission. As we say many times, a photo is worth a thousand words, and I believe that says it all. Let's shift our attention to the lower right-hand corner. This is a scene that we see many times and unfortunately happens way too often. When the tactics of the Taliban are utilized successfully, this is usually the result at any particular target location. The Taliban's hopes and wishes are that the opposition will hesitate those two to three seconds which will be enough time to initiate the diversion or complete the attack. It's a difficult situation to be in whether you're a foot soldier observing this tactic 
or the investigator at the scene after the fact trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. The entire stage must be set beforehand in order to understand the dynamics and behaviors involved. Until this process is completed and understood, one cannot possibly make any judgments or evaluate the actions of anyone. Relying solely on post-event sentiment as an investigative tool is totally ineffective and inappropriate. The village Saranzai is quite small, and as documented, the Zare district has been called the ancestral home of the Taliban. As a result of enemy activity in this remote area, the 1st platoon sustained four serious casualties immediately before 1st Lieutenant Lawrence assumed command. The former platoon leader, 1st Lieutenant Latino, sustained peppering shrapnel wounds to his abdomen, limbs, eyes, and face when a hidden improvised explosive device detonated. Private First Class Wally lost his right arm below his elbow, right leg below his knee, and incurred serious soft tissue damage to his left leg. Private First Class Kerner was hit in the thighs, buttocks, while Specialist Haynes was shot in the throat. The gunshot fractured his vertebrae, broke his rib, collapsed his lung, and he is now paralyzed from the waist down. Mindful of these casualties, Clint pledged that he wanted nobody else killed or wounded while he was the platoon leader. Prior to the events at issue, the incident where Specialist Haynes was shot in the throat, an NCO on the scene at the time of the shooting reported that the gunfire originated from the north end of the village. This is the same area where the motorcycles and insurgents on foot congregated. The area where Specialist Haynes was hit was the same infiltration route the 1st platoon took on July 2nd, 2012. Early that morning on July 2nd, 2012, 15 U.S. paratroopers led by Lieutenant Clint Lawrence, along with a squad of five ANA, conducted a combat patrol in the village of Saranzai. On that patrol, they encountered eight to 10 military-aged males on foot, using ICOM radios and on motorcycles in this desolate area of Kandahar province in the heat of summer, which hovers around 120 degrees. On that patrol were Private First Class Skelton, a former civilian police officer and a veteran of combat during his tour on this field. Also, Private First Class Shiloh, a gun truck turret machine gunner, and Staff Sergeant Herman, a squad leader with his rifleman Private First Class Carson. Prior to initiating the patrol, Lieutenant Lawrence placed Strong Point Gun Truck 1 and 2 for security and overwatch for the foot patrol. Restricted area signs stating police and military use only were in place on both roadway locations. Both signs were in English and Afghan. The signs were in full view on both roadways and were not obstructed in any way. Before the patrol steps off from the strong point, Lieutenant Lawrence requests and waits for air support to provide stability and overwatch. The visibility was limited for the paratroopers as they had to climb up and down six to eight foot berms, photos of which we'll see shortly. The mission was to deny enemy access to historical firing positions in the village. A single file route of march behind a minesweeper was conducted due to so many IEDs and landmines. This direction of movement was their normal infiltration and exfiltration routes. The images of the berms gives us a great reference as to what Lieutenant Lawrence and his soldiers had to deal with while on their foot patrols in and out of the village, and why Lieutenant Lawrence requested air support for visibility before they began their patrol. The following slides depict a single evolving action where the enemy was either preparing to attack but was disrupted or was planning a scouting and or recon mission of the patrol or calling for reinforcements via ICOM radios. Please keep in mind that this is a fluid event that seems to have many moving parts, but keep focused on the TTPs we discussed earlier and the designed one complex attack strategy that was orchestrated by the insurgents that day. The ANA was the lead element of a combined ANA US patrol as they approached the eastern edge of Savanzai village. Private First Class Skelton reached the base of the berm and begins to climb it with Lieutenant Lawrence behind them. The patrol is in a single file route of march behind the minesweeper and exposed with limited maneuverability while crossing the road. 
On station, Air Assets report to Lieutenant Lawrence of suspicious activity of several military-aged males on foot and with motorcycles huddling. Please note that Lieutenant Lawrence is the only one receiving this information from the air support. Military-aged males gathering with motorcycles is widely known as a common TTP for insurgents, as we discussed earlier. Lieutenant Lawrence cannot see where this concentration of military-aged males is, so he requests air support to drop smoke on that location. Three male riders on a single motorcycle then head east and then south at an excessive rate of speed toward the first platoon's single file exposed route of march across the road. The riders are pointing, gesturing, and ignoring the ANA warnings to stop and were also disregarding the warning signs that were in full view. At the same time, military aged males on foot with ICOM radios begin tactically navigating the Great Berm from the north and then heading south and then east toward the village. The 1st Platoon's Staff Sergeant Herman and Private First Class Carson reach the rooftop at the far western edge of the village. Private First Class Skelton, a veteran of months of combat on this very field, perceived the threat from the top of the berm, called it out, and Lieutenant Lawrence, still at the bottom of the berm, without any visuals, reacts to the information given to him by Private First Class Skelton and the air support then gives the order to engage. Private First Class Skelton, still at the top of the berm, fired at the moving bike but missed. Lieutenant Lawrence then gave the order over the radio. Private First Class Shiloh, manning a 240 Bravo on the turret of gun truck one, hit two riders but the third escaped. The third rider was captured and in subsequent interviews was identified as Haji Karamula. Lieutenant Lawrence never fired his weapon throughout this exchange. Staff Sergeant Herman and Private First Class Carson were perched on the roof of the tallest mud building on the west side of the village and visually observed military-aged males tactically approaching using ICOM radios. Staff Sergeant Herman and Private First Class Carson also observed that the group of military-aged males were bobbing and weaving while using their radios. Private First Class Carson stated, get down, we're about to get shot at. The insurgents' ICOM radio transmissions were intercepted via low-level voice interceptor and relayed to Lieutenant Lawrence real-time. Translation revealed, we have to do something to the Americans. Without seeking permission or receiving orders, Staff Sergeant Herman and Private First Class Carson engage, killing two of the three military-age males. The third was wounded and picked up by the ANA squad while hiding in a back room of a mud hut in the village. He was later identified as Muhammad Rahim. He tested positive for homemade explosives on his hands and was later released. A second motorcycle headed south at the same time and was driven by a lone rider. He was stopped by gun truck two and also tested positive for homemade explosives on his hands. And he too was later released. One note of importance, Lieutenant Lawrence was not in the decision-making process in regards to the release of Muhammad Rahim for the unidentified lone rider. Now that we have presented and explained the engagement areas and the individuals involved who displayed behavior that initiated the events on July 2nd, 2012, which resulted in four enemy killed in action and two enemy wounded in action, we can now move on to the backgrounds of the insurgents and show the direct and indirect associations to IED facilitation, emplacement, insurgent activities, and death to U.S. personnel. Now, let's look at the backgrounds of the three insurgents on the motorcycle of the first event. Through the interview of Abdul Ahad on July 2, 2012 by CID, we have identified three of the riders at the first event of the complex attack as Muhammad Aslam, Gameh, and Haji Karamula. Ahad's connections to the two events are as follows. Abdul Ahad was the son of Muhammad Aslam, one of the riders killed in the first event. He was also the brother of Gameh, also a rider killed in the first event. He was the nephew of Haji Karamula, the third rider of the first event, who attempted to escape after the incident. Cousin of Ja Muhammad, who was one of the two individuals killed during the second event. He was also associated to four IED events, three of which occurred prior to his interview with CID on July 2, 2012. And finally, he was released from the detention facility in Paul Wan, also known as the DFIP, in 2009. Now we're going to go over 
Background on each of the three riders of the first event. Rider number one, Haji Karamula, linked to one IED event on August 31st, 2012, with an IED emplacer identified as Idula. An event occurred in the Zari district. He was uncle to Abdul Ahad, friends with Muhammad Rahim, which was stated in an interview conducted by CID. And again, he escaped after the July 2nd, 2012 incident, but was captured shortly thereafter. Rider 2, known as Game, brother to Abdul Ahad, linked to an IED event which occurred on May 12, 2012 in the Zare district. Also involved in that event was a major IED emplacer known as Gul Nazi. He was connected to 13 other events, all of which occurred in the Zare district. They both were connected to the Kandahar 29 IED cell. Game was killed on July 2, 2012 for disregarding lawful commands and riding on a restricted roadway. Rider 3, known as Muhammad Aslam, father of Abdul Ahad, also killed on July 2, 2012 for disregarding lawful commands and riding on a restricted roadway. This event occurred in the Zari district on August 31st, 2012. To keep track of our associations and links, we will label all of the events, which will make it easier to show common events shared by our insurgents. After a routine check of the ID activity in and around the Zari district, it was discovered that these individuals had links and associations to ID and insurgent activities throughout the Zari district. As we begin to build our IED insurgent network, we see immediately that one of our riders, Haji Karamula, was associated to an IED event where his fingerprints and or DNA, also known as biometrics, were found on the IED components. This IED event 120156 is an event that is also shared by a prolific IED facilitator named Ayadullah, which we discussed earlier. Ayadullah has 15 IED events attributed to him with his fingerprints and or DNA found on the components. Ayadullah also has an Afghan national warrant issued for his capture. Rider 2, known as Game, brother to Abdul Ahad, linked to an IED event which occurred on May 12, 2012 in the Zare district. Also involved in that event was a major IED emplacer known as Gul Nazi. He was connected to 13 other events, all of which occurred in the Zare district. They both were connected to the Kandahar 29 IED cell. Game was killed on July 2, 2012 for disregarding lawful commands and riding on a restricted roadway. He was associated to 14 IED events through his biometrics. He was captured by coalition forces and was brought to the Justice Center in Parwan, Afghanistan, where he was found guilty for his insurgent activities and is now serving a 20-year sentence. Nazi was part of one of the largest IED cells in Kandahar. The third rider in the first phase of our complex attack was also killed when he disregarded all commands to comply, and he was identified as Muhammad Aslam through interviews after the incident. Aslam was the father of Abdul Ahad, who was previously interviewed by CID on July 2, 2012. A routine check of the ID activity in the Zare district revealed that Ahad was biometrically associated to four events, two in Zare, one in Panjwe, and one in Maywan. Network starts to grow. We see that Ayadullah's ID activities have connected him to another crucial association, ID event number S1051247, where his biometrics again were found on the components that were placed in a commonly used or IED prone location. That location was at grid number 41RQR313751, also located in the Zari district. This location was also utilized by one of Ayadullah's co conspirators, and we will call him unknown cell member number one, and he has a biometric number of B2JK8. TVCH. 
He was connected to IED event E131126. Two separate events, same IED prone location was utilized. This shared location between Iadula and unknown cell member number one forms a solid link and association of the two and displays a clear connection to U.S. casualties. Before we move on with the presentation, let's go over what is an unknown cell member. An unknown cell member is when an individual's fingerprints and DNA are processed through a lab and the findings show that there are no corresponding fingerprints or DNA that match to an individual that has already been identified and officially enrolled into the system. Identification and enrollment is done when a person applies for employment, is detained in question and then released, participating in a census, or is simply captured and is processed through a detention facility. If at any time this unknown individual is detained or is enrolled in any way, those unknown biometrics will then be immediately matched once this enrollment process is completed. There are many insurgents that remain in an unknown status because they were never officially enrolled or registered. It's very important not to put less emphasis on unknown cell members just because they are not identified. They are still individuals who are involved in criminal and insurgent activities. They are just as valuable as identified entities. And one side note, you will see from this point on biometric numbers that are associated with all individuals, whether known or unknown. And this is simply a, like a biometric social security number, which is associated to any fingerprint or DNA that is processed through the lab. That number never changes. We have identified two of the three riders in the second event of the complex attack on July 2nd, 2012, as Muhammad Rahim and John Muhammad, and an unknown insurgent. John Muhammad and the unknown insurgent's body was released to the family before any official biometrics could be taken. The same happened with Muhammad Rahim. He was treated and released before the same biometrics could be conducted. Muhammad Rahim, wounded in this July 2nd, 2012 attack. Upon his detainment, he was tested positive for homemade explosives on his hands. He was brought to the Kandahar Hospital where he was treated and released. He stated he was friends with Haji Karamula, the escaped rider from the first event. He's linked to IED event 12, 1797. The area of this event was an IED prone location utilized by 21 other facilitators, initiating 27 events on different dates and times. 159 IED events associated with the facilitators that use this location. Some of these facilitators are involved in the casualties of U.S. military personnel. John Muhammad, shot and killed on the July 2, 2012 incident by Staff Sergeant Herman and Private First Class Carson, moments and meters from the first motorcycle incident. Unknown cell member, enemy killed in action, shot and killed on the July 2, 2012 incident by Staff Sergeant Herman and Private First Class Carson, moments and meters from the first motorcycle incident. As with the first event, a routine check of the IED activity in and around the Zari district was conducted and showed that Muhammad Rahim had links and associations to IED events, locations, and insurgent activities. Muhammad Rahim not only was friends with Haji Karamula, but was also biometrically connected to an IED event which occurred in the Zari district on June 12, 2012, at one of the most IED prone locations in Kandahar. His location was utilized by 21 other known and unknown IED emplacers, conducting 27 events at different dates and times. One of those emplacers, who is an unidentified cell member, will be known from this point forward as B28JS3JCR, which is a biometric identity number. He was biometrically linked to 60 IED events that were facilitated throughout the country of Afghanistan. One of those 60 events, 12-1705, was shared with another facilitator by the name of Ali Ahmad, an active emplacer who also was involved in another event, 12-1500, which was initiated in the Zari district on May 31, 2012, where a U.S. soldier was killed. 
Another IED event, 11507330, linked to B28JS3JCR, was also shared with a very active unknown cell member and facilitator who will be identified from this point forward as B28JS3LY, who also was involved in another event, 104223, which occurred in June of 2010, outside the Zare district where a U.S. soldier was killed. He was biometrically linked to 28 IED events that were facilitated throughout the country of Afghanistan. As you can see, both of these facilitators had a countrywide IED operation that was directly connected to the insurgents that were involved in the complex attacks on July 2, 2012. We can clearly see that these two individuals, even though unidentified, are still as dangerous as the identified insurgents we track on a daily basis. During the second event, an unidentified lone rider headed south from his initial mobilization point where he gathered with other riders and insurgents. Before he was able to escape from the engagement area, he was detained by gun truck number two. U.S. personnel at the gun truck location observed him rubbing his hands in the dirt, which is a sure sign in that situation that he was trying to remove any remaining residue from his hands. The lone rider was immediately tested for explosive residue, where his results showed positive for homemade explosives. After some initial questioning, he was released without being identified or having any fingerprints or DNA taken to be entered into the biometric database to see if he was connected to any IED or insurgent activities. As stated earlier in this presentation, Lieutenant Lawrence had no involvement in the release process of any of the individuals involved in the two events. Before we conclude this presentation, let's do a quick recap of the individuals and events involved on July 2nd, 2012. All the individuals displayed were observed by air assets congregating in the northwest corner of the engagement area. The individuals in no way were out picking grapes, as some might say, as to why they were at the location. Three of the individuals tried to escape after the incident, which is not what an innocent person would do. Two of the individuals tested positive for homemade explosives. One tried to wipe explosive residue off his hands, again, not exactly innocent behavior. Four of the individuals were related to an IND placer, Abdul Ahad, who had been detained at the detention facility in Pawan a few years prior. Now, when we look at the network link chart, the individuals are familiar to us and all the connections and associations are clear and make sense. We can see that the individuals of both events are directly and indirectly associated with IED facilitators and in places that not only operated in the Zari district, but around the entire country of Afghanistan. These associations are also linked to the deaths of U.S. personnel and the wounding of many others. As we near the completion of our presentation and we understand the dynamics of the environment involved, we see that the individuals that initiated the event were not innocent civilians, but insurgents whose behavior triggered the response by U.S. personnel. To label the individuals as males of apparent Afghan descent is inappropriate and tells the reader and any investigator that all correct protocols were not conducted during the tactical site exploitation and crime scene process and no effort was made to identify all the individuals detained and released and those that were killed. In any investigation, this deviation from protocol would and should leave a huge hole in the investigation and case file, a hole that would attract the attention of any defense attorney. An experienced investigator knows that there's always information to be found that would be beneficial to a case. The question is, what is the motivation? After reading and understanding this presentation, the reader now knows the entire stage before and after the incident, as we discussed in the first few slides of this presentation. It is only now, with this mindset, can a person understand what Lieutenant Lawrence felt, saw, heard, and tasted during the complex attack on July 2nd, 2012. Any reasonable person would have made the same decision Lieutenant Lawrence made, given the same circumstances. And as we have seen in previous slides, hesitating those two to three seconds can be a disastrous and deadly situation.
My name is William Carney, and I'm the defense team's investigator, advisor, and narrator for this presentation. My goal throughout this display is to present and explain all the individuals, locations, and events that pertain to this case before, during, and after the incident on July 2, 2012. Painting a clear picture of all these dynamics is a must, and is the only way an audience can get a ringside seat and get a real feel for these unique set of circumstances. This clear view will create a mindset as to where our soldiers had to live, work, and last but not least, survive in on a daily basis. Please, let's also remember that this newly discovered evidence you're about to see was obtained in the ordinary course of business from U.S. government databases used routinely in identifying, tracking, and prosecuting the Taliban and insurgent fighters in Afghanistan. These databases will be familiar to some. One in particular is called SIDNI, the Combined Information Data Network Exchange. The methods used to assess this evidence are the same as those forwarded to the Afghan investigators, prosecutors, judges, and defense attorneys used during prosecution of the Taliban and insurgent fighters in Afghanistan before the national security courts, such as those in the Justice Center in Palwan, Bagram Airfield, Afghanistan. The evidence explained throughout this presentation shows that had the prosecution properly and timely disclosed it, there would have been a more favorable result for First Lieutenant Lawrence. The biometric appendix is a quick reference guide to all the individuals that were directly or indirectly related to the incident on July 2nd, 2012. Each individual has their own biometric number and number of events. Please take note to the unknown biometric ID. Those are unknown cell members as we discussed earlier. And please notice the number of events that are associated to the two individuals. Again, they are just as important as identified individuals, as we have seen throughout this case. These cases resulted in the positive identification of thousands of IED in places and co-conspirators and known associates within the IED networks in Afghanistan's Kandahar province. His work was relied upon by U.S. forces, Afghan police, Afghan prosecutors, and Afghan judges in approximately two to 3,000 criminal trials before Afghan courts involving IED events, which were criminalized and prosecuted by Afghans under Afghan law. His classes on tactical site exploitation for purpose of investigating IED and terror cells received excellent reviews from the Army, Marine, and Special Operations Units throughout Afghanistan. Over the course of his seven years in Afghanistan, his investigation of IED in places, events, and cells has resulted in a successful prosecution in Afghan courts of approximately two to 3,000 members of the Taliban and IED terrorists, both of which are crimes under international Afghan law. Mr. Carney applied the same knowledge, skills, training, and experience used in his seven years of investigation in Afghanistan in preparing this presentation in support of Clint Lawrence's petition for a new trial.